I'm going to talk about random walks and some related things and uh, the things which I will start to talk about are so simple that uh, it's maybe a shame of me on talking about that. But okay, so uh, here is the uh, general outline of the presentation. Uh, I will start with anomalous uh, fluctuations of uh, random works and then I will uh, try to show that there is, might be some relation with spectral density of sparse random matrices and finally I will end up with a uh, more detailed description of uh, spectral density in terms of some modular functions uh, like the Dekin function. Uh, okay, but okay, so let us go step by step. <coughs> Uh, and I will start with the model, which is very, very simple. Uh, of course, everybody knows that. Uh, so the, the, the situation is like that. You have upper half plane. You can imagine that this is the square lattice, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so and you have random walk on the lattice, which starts in this point A, ends in the point B, and there are no interactions, it's just a single random walk and the only restriction is that it, it avoids, it cannot be inside the semicircle which is here and cannot go down. Uh, so the question uh, we are asking is the following. Uh, what is the span, what is the typical height of this random walk above the point O? Yeah? So the random walk has n steps, the radius of this semicircle is r, and uh, suppose that a uh, number of steps is very large, such that it's much bigger than uh, radius, so it scales for instance like that, and then of course for this random walk, uh, this small bump is almost invisible, and <coughs> the uh, span of the trajectory, so this average uh, height uh, is like in ordinary diffusion, the square root of number of steps. I cannot go inside the region. Uh, yeah, it's redistributed. No. Or if you have diffusion, you can say that you put Dirichlet boundary condition on the boundary. Okay. Uh, but in, in principle, uh, what, what you are saying, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, <coughs> because uh, as, as you will see, not much depends on the direct interactions of the random walk with the boundary. Uh. Okay, but now the question is like that. Suppose that I uh, change this condition and I say that my trajectory is in some sense stretched. Uh, the number of steps is proportional to the uh, length of the boundary. So I would say number of steps n is some coefficient times r. What is your guess? How would the fluctuations, how would this d behave? Okay, so I have no time, unfortunately, to wait. Uh, the answer is a bit like that. Yeah? So it's a bit unexpected uh, that you change the scaling behavior. Uh, and the fluctuations behave like uh, r in power one third. And uh, <coughs> this is the signature of Tracy Widom distribution, in fact, which is. Uh, uh, appears for correlated random walks. Here we have no any correlations, but the curvature makes some job. Yeah, so we have this kind of behavior. Okay, so one step further. Uh, let's do almost the same, but uh, instead of having a semicircle, let's consider the triangle. The question is the same. Uh, the span of the trajectory above the tip of the triangle 
uh, in the diffusion regime, nothing is changed. And what you would expect in the uh, stretched regime, like that. <coughs> so the first attempt, my attempt, is to give some hand-waving arguments to show uh, how this could happen. Uh, and the explanation is very simple. <coughs> Let's consider the stretch strand of walk. So stretching means uh, I imply this condition. And uh, so the trajectory is above. And I consider the part of this trajectory near the point O such that I can uh, flatten uh, this, this region. So between points this and this, uh, I can replace the curved uh, geometry just by flat line. What would be this, uh, when, where I can do that? So uh, linearizing curved shape, I can write that X is the horizontal direction. So it's just Pythagore theorem. And then I expand this when Y is smaller than R. And I have this one. And this is one, <laughs> one uh, uh, relation which relates X and Y. So Y is the uh, uh, vertical direction and X is horizontal one. And now, uh, since I can say that now this uh, horizontal direction is uh, flat, so what would be the random walk above it? And of course, it's just a random walk. So it y is proportional to square root of x. And now I should simultaneously solve these two equations, x proportional to this one and y proportional to this one. And you immediately find this relation. OK. Uh, just one line argument. But uh, it, it seems rather geometric. But I, I will try to convince you that uh, there is some physics behind. But first, uh, let us consider instead of a semicircle uh, algebraic curve. Uh, I can rewrite uh, uh, the, the, the curve uh, which bounds this uh, uh, inaccessible surface in such scaling form independent on a dimensional variable y over r is proportional to x over r in some power. Uh, if this power is 2, I am in class of quadratic curves. And I return to the case I, I just discussed. But this could be not, it, it should not oblige to be 2. And uh, so I can simultaneously uh, solve this and this. Uh, 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 sorry, so this and, and, and this equation, and then you get that your span of trajectory above the algebraic curve is given by the scaling exponent, by the critical exponent, uh, which is like that. So you see that if eta is 2, you return to 1 third. And if eta is 1, which means that you have your curvature is concentrated at the cusp uh, and this is just the case of uh, triangle. So then you have zero, and it means that uh, your span is more or less constant. So you cover both cases. It cannot be less than one, so it's physically inaccessible. Uh, so something more behind uh, what we could say about this, because uh, we are in stretched regime, so it means that we have sort of... Uh, okay, so uh, first let me return to that and say a few words about physics. So you see what happens. <coughs> uh, my trajectory in this stretched regime is in very... It, it, it leaves in very improbable uh, situation because if I would eliminate this semicircle, then it would fluctuate just near the straight line, near the boundary, because its length is uh, proportional to the uh, distance between A and B. 
And when I insert the circle, I push my trajectory to a very tiny, very unprobable region. And then it fluctuates in just, just there, far away from normal situation. So uh, apparently, uh, the one ingredient of this anomalous behavior is the fact that the trajectory is pushed from the normal to a tiny region of the phase space. And to, to, to check whether this is true or not, we have considered, uh, and this part is with Sasha Gorsky and uh, uh, Alexander Valov, our uh, <coughs> PhD students from uh, Institute of Chemical Physics in Moscow. Uh, we did the following. Uh, we consider the, uh, so instead of having semicircle, we consider just the closed loop. So this is red is particular realization of random walk trajectory, uh, which is closed. And then uh, we see that we inflate it as much as possible. Inflate means that we increase the algebra in, yeah, algebraic area inside uh, this loop. Uh, when we increase it till the very end, so it means that it becomes just the, uh, just the ring. But we inflate, but not, we, we leave some space for fluctuations. This is possible to do, there are different ways, but uh, mathematically it's very <laughs> easy to do that. Uh, in the following way. We say that uh, this random walk is nothing else than the propagation of the charged particle, and we put transversal magnetic field in, in this direction, perpendicular to the plane, such that this field is very strong, and so therefore the trajectory, uh, this uh, is word line of the trajectory, just expels. Uh, so it's, uh, I I if you would, so the Hamiltonian is written like that, so it's just uh, nothing else, uh, constant magnetic field. And this is Laplacian, random walk. Uh, so, and then uh, if you would say that you would consider classical trajectory associated with the, this uh, model, so you will have nothing else as just Larmor uh, precession of, of, of this charged particle. So, and then you can consider fluctuations on, on top of this uh, Larmor field. Uh, of this Larmor trajectory, and uh, uh, the, the problem for uh, uh, task problem for, for students, you should solve this kind of equation where B is uh, <coughs> sufficiently strong. So, and in this inflated regime, uh, we can get the full solution. It, it can be written in terms of uh, Laguerre polynomials, so, and then the uh, asymptotic behavior is Gaussian. Uh, and actually we have checked that, uh, so this highly inflated random walk uh, near the, uh, uh, <coughs> near, near the uh, when, when its algebraic area is uh, large, so still has Gaussian behavior yeah, so this delta R is the, fluc the fluctuations. And the scaling exponent uh, is like uh, in Gaussian case. So we see that uh, just the uh, large deviation is not sufficient in order to have this anomalous scaling. What else? The boundary. So we made almost the same uh, except that we have the following. We have inflated our random walk, and then we have inserted inside the solid ring, such that this boundary is uh, uh, rigid. So it means that one can say the trajectory is leaning on this, it touches this boundary, it cannot penetrate inside. What is the difference with respect to this situation? Here, the trajectory still, because <coughs> there is no, no boundary on which, which it touches, still has possibility to have large size fluctuations. While these uh, large size fluctuations are <coughs> uh, 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 could not appear and only local fluctuations of trajectory remain. So if we proceed 
almost the same as, uh, as in this situation, but consider properly the boundary conditions and look for the deviations of the uh, inflated path near, near the boundary, near the uh, uh, border of the, uh, this ring. So then immediately, instead of Gaussian behavior, we get the distribution function in terms of a square function. And this, of course, has already uh, this anomalous scaling. Uh, so now we can uh, proceed and do the following. Uh, we can uh, change this radius. So we have trajectory of uh, <coughs> given length. Uh, and we change the inserted uh, disk, the size of inserted disk. Uh, so we, we decrease it and uh, we decreasing it, we allow more space for fluctuations of the path. So, and we see that trajectory from strongly inflated situation when disc is uh, big decreases. So uh, the, the, the fluctuations increase uh, from uh, one third behavior to one two behavior. Yeah, so whether this is phase transition or not is a point for discussion. I will not touch for a moment this. So here is the sample of the uh, same consideration of the same model when the, trajectory, when the trajectory has the same length, but the size of the disk is very small. So you see there is space for fluctuations and these fluctuations are Gaussian. Okay. Uh, what I would like to emphasize, uh, just this uh, behavior that, uh, so one can apply, so since I'm a physicist, uh, uh, I can uh, imply some, uh, some consideration in terms of Degen uh, in the following way. I can split, so uh, on, on the very first slide, I, I said that there is some region uh, where uh, I can flatten the, uh, the boundary and say that uh, uh, above it, the random walk behaves like above the flat space. So I, because this is symmetric, I can do this in many places. So therefore, uh, typically the, the, the longitudinal distance, so along the, along, the, so along the boundary is more or less the correlation length. So uh, I go about, more or less, I go, go, go along the flat space, and then I should correct my, my, my trajectory. So now here I have another, uh, uh, another angle. Now I should correct again, and so on and so forth, yeah? So therefore, L is more or less the correlation length for the trajectory where I have this anomalous behavior. So, and uh, uh, this uh, direction is, uh, like that, and this is square of this uh, of this uh, <coughs> of this size. So I can estimate the free energy of of the whole path as number of steps divided by number of these uh, number of these uh, blobs. Yeah. So uh, and I have this one. So and then uh, since this is something like uh, free energy, I can estimate the Gibbs measure. Uh, like that, so and it behaves like the following. Yeah, so you see, uh, e to the power minus r one third. Uh, okay, now I change the subject, and uh, I will return to that, of course. But uh, just uh, what this reminds. Uh, let's consider the classical problem. Uh, the classical problem since uh, Donsker Varadan, uh, Balagurov Vax, and so you see 1974. Uh, the problem is the following. So you have one dimensional uh, array of uh, random traps. So maybe I, uh, here is not so. Um, so there is no, tra ah, yeah, of course there is. Uh, <coughs> So I have just random intervals. 
uh, they are exponentially distributed. And then on each interval, I run the random walk. Uh, and I ask what is the survival probability of this random walk. So survival probability means that my random walk uh, ends when it touches the boundary. It dies at the, at the boundary. So <coughs> what would be this uh, survival probability? And this estimation is very known. It, it can be computed exactly, but there are some, uh, again, so-called uh, optimal fluctuations used widely in uh, solid state physics. And this uh, optimal fluctuation method is like balancing the different parts of the free energy. And uh, OK, so on one hand, I have the probability of, so these are my intervals. So this is one interval. This is second interval, third, fourth, and so on. I just glue them one, together, one after, after another. Uh, so, uh, the typical size of some, some interval is D, so therefore the probability uh, of, uh, so in, uh, if this distribution is exponential, so then uh, the typical entropy of creation, of spontaneous creation of the interval of size D is logarithm of the probability distribution. Okay, this is one side, entropic. And another is just the random walk inside the interval, and I can estimate its free energy, I can solve diffusion equation with boundary conditions, but in fact, it's sufficient to compute the uh, smallest eigenvalue of this diffusion equation, and it behaves like number of steps divided by uh, square root of uh, size of this uh, interval. So, now I should balance this one and this one, yeah? And if you will uh, compute the minimum of the free uh, energy, so then you will immediately get the, the, uh, uh, the distribution which is uh, known as balagurov wax or donsker varadan law. Uh, note that it behaves, it has the same scaling. Uh, just one more step, uh, if you do the inverse Laplace transform of that, uh, so you just, you see that uh, N is, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, you consider N as in grand canonical ensemble, so then in, you get the, uh, you consider the inverse Laplace transform, you get uh, this kind of asymptotic behavior, which is nothing else as so-called Lipschitz scale of one-dimensional Anderson localization. Now, uh, let us compare these two situations, whether they are similar or not, because, of, so now uh, I am back with the uh, Richard uh, today's talk. Uh, if the laughs are the same, uh, whether the physics is the same. Uh, yeah, let's consider this as a black box and we have only the equations, what we can say about physics inside. Uh, okay, so uh, my point of view that there is some connection, uh, and <clears throat> the connection is uh, very straightforward. If you do the same optimal optim optimal fluctuation estimations of this uh, uh, random walk above the curve geometry, uh, and compare it with the, uh, the the optimal fluctuations I just explained. So I will not go into details. One can balance the free energy here in, this, in the same manner as here, and you get almost the same equations, uh, even they are more general. So I would say that in, in, in this, comparing these two systems, one can say that in some sense, curvature replaces the disorder. So uh, how one, one can speculate about physics, but it looks like that. Uh, Okay, so now uh, Gibbs measure of trajectory above the uh, uh, curved uh, surface and uh, survival probability in Poissonian distribution of random traps in 1D. So they behave in the same way. Uh, but about this system, we know something more. And 
uh, maybe we can translate this in, into that also. Uh, what we know more? Uh, and now I return to the last, so I have 10 minutes, I think it's sufficient. Uh, uh, no, I have more, yeah. Uh, good. Um, spectral density of sparse random matrices. Uh, let's consider uh, the following. I will return back, it's uh, not isolated subject. Uh, let's consider the uh, sparse random matrix. So it means that I have quadratic matrix, square matrix, and uh, the entries are one or zeros with probability r and with probability one minus r. And r is very, very small, so I stay near at the percolation regime, at the percolation border. Uh, for instance, for this specific matrix, which is of size 50 by 50, it's, uh, I have graphs uh, like that. So graphs is, is the following. I can consider this as a sort of adjacency matrix of some graph. So therefore, uh, if I enumerate the, the, the links, if I enumerate the vertices, so then I have the uh, edge uh, when uh, I is connected to J. Uh, so when uh, I is connected to J, so then uh, I have a link, otherwise I haven't. So, and uh, for this matrix, I have such a uh, number of uh, subgraphs. So you see that there are almost no complex graphs and uh, the graphs are either uh, linear chains or some branching structures. If I would increase, uh, okay, so if I would increase uh, this probability, or I will make bigger, I will stay above the percolation regime. So then, uh, so, uh, then I will uh, get more, more complex structures and uh, I increasing, I increasing uh, uh, no probability, uh, you see they become more and more complex. And uh, finally, I have some circles, some have some loops and so on. Uh, this, I, I don't care about that. My situation is uh, more or less here. And <coughs> Uh, this is sample of collection of subgraphs uh, when n is large and uh, you see that trees, some fraction of trees and uh, linear subchain. Okay. Uh, let us look for the spectral density. Yeah. Let us look at the spectral density of this ensemble of uh, sparse graphs. So that's what we get. And uh, you see that it has some sort of uh, so-called ultrametric behavior. So it means that uh, there are some peaks. So one can imagine that these are some barriers, uh, some peaks. And uh, these peaks are separated by smaller peaks. And these smaller peaks are separated by smaller again, and so on and so forth. So it has some hierarchy. And here is uh, the same but logarithmic plot. Uh, what we have proven <coughs> uh, in uh, 2016, uh, we have separately uh, compared, we computed the fraction of linear subgraphs and all. Uh. Good. So I, I think it's just sort of emotional support. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, and what we have found, and this is exact result, that in thermodynamic limit, when the system is very large, so then the fraction of uh, linear, linear means like that. So subchains li like that, including separated points, but not branching structures. Uh, that at percolation threshold, there are almost 95% uh, of linear chains and they have exponential distribution. 
So therefore, of course, the first attempt, because we cannot solve the problem exactly, but the first attempt is just to say, okay, so let's forget about 5% of, of the rest and consider only this one. And if we have these linear chains, so then we end up uh, uh, with the following problem. Uh, we can uh, consider the, so this ensemble of, of linear chains, we can mimic in the following uh, uh, adjacency, single adjacency matrix. We have just three di two diagonal uh, uh, adjacency matrix where each x is indep independently can take values uh, 0 or 1. Yeah, So 1 with probability p, 0 with probability 1 minus p. So and uh, this generates your just the ensemble of linear chains and because the uh, the, the ensemble is exponential so then uh, this is consistent with the fact that these uh, all x's are independently distributed okay so uh, how looks the sorry uh, how looks the uh, uh, probably I haven't here okay so I'll show later uh, <coughs> so now we should uh, solve the following problem so here is the adjacency matrix. We have some uh, set of ones separated by zeros in, in random places. So then once again and so on. Uh, and this is exactly as, uh, what is uh, shown in this slide few, few slides before. I have some, one can say interval like that. We have some interval. Inside we have just uh, a random walk or Laplacian, discrete Laplacian, and uh, uh, and okay, and so then we should average over all possibilities of uh, of uh, um, cells of size uh, uh, of given size. So we, we of course we know the spectrum, and uh, this is easy to compute uh, of e of each cell. So the spectrum is like that. How looks the uh, yeah, if we, if we are interested, if we are interested in the spectral density, uh, okay, so this is a bit more tricky, but still, so this is the formal definition. Uh, I, I should uh, uh, take some lambda, yeah, so the lambda is the eigenvalue, and then uh, I should compute the expectation of delta function uh, of, uh, of this sum. So uh, double sum, rather tricky. But, uh, okay, so we can try to analyze it. And uh, what we found is the following. Uh, first, we found the behavior like that. So you see that it reproduces the, the, the one we, we, which we have seen on large sparse matrices. Uh, here, uh, the, this, uh, this um, hierarchical behavior is even more profound. So <laughs> if we would like to, if you would like uh, to, to compute what is the shape of this enveloping curve. So then near the edge of the spectrum, we can reproduce the behavior of uh, what, what I showed you before, just exactly the same uh, so-called Anderson uh, tail. And uh, this too is uh, just because I have computed everything from, 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 from zero, but not from this one. Uh, what we can say more, uh, now we end up with the following. Uh, we can analyze this picture parametrically. So first we can try to find the positions of these uh, peaks and then their heights. Uh, the position is given by the following. So you know this fourth picture, yeah? Uh, so you have the interval between zero and one, you have circles which touch each other and touch the, uh, the, the, the ends of the interval. And then you inscribe the other circles and you would like to, to find the uh, positions of the centers. So by the symmetry, uh, the O3 is one over two, but what is the position for instance of this one? So you should sum nominator plus nominator and denominator plus denominator, so this one. Uh, and you get uh, the, the, this position. So these are nothing else than just relations of array numbers. And now you can see that immediately uh, you have the 
hidden property of uh, discrete geometry uh, related to, uh, to discrete transformations of um, uh, Lobachevsky geometry. So, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you have domain, fundamental domain of the modular group and then you make reflections, uh, the, the centers of these uh, sequential transformations are, really, are exactly the, the, the positions of these, um, of these centers. So, we know the positions of all peaks and these are Fari numbers. Uh, but now uh, we should compute the amplitudes, the degeneracy. And this is a bit more tricky, and, but the, the idea is that, I will not go to, in, into details, but the idea is that uh, having this sum, double sum, you should, you, you can see that for lambda, uh, for a given lambda, uh, the contribution comes not from specific n, but both from k and from n. So because you sum, you have double sum. So you should somehow resum this massage this function in order to uh, compute uh, for given lambda contributions from all different uh, terms from, from both thumbs. In words, in short, in short is the following. So the procedure is, uh, the procedure is as follows. You have the lattice and so then these are the probabilities. So this is the probability in power z 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. And then you emit the rays from zero uh, on rational tangents of angles. Uh, this is uh, my, my uh, lambda. So this uh, tangent is uh, cosine of, so this is just a cosine of this. Uh, so, and you see that, for instance, when you go along this way, so you sum uh, geometric series uh, just one step after another. When you go along some uh, rational angle, for instance, two thirds, you sum not all of them, but you skip some points and you sum uh, just part of this. Uh, so here is more or less the, the show how it happens. So, uh, for instance, I, I consider uh, the, the, this shape, so the series, so this peak, this peak, this, 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 and so on. So they are they have uh, this representation uh, in terms of Fari fractions. And for each of them, you should uh, sum the series, just as I said, uh, each th second, each third, and so on. And in this way, uh, so you, if you uh, go further, uh, you get the following. You, you see that this uh, in, uh, in the limiting situation when n is very large, number of uh, elements is very large, size of the matrix. So then this uh, function converges to the following. Uh, so instead of this tricky sum, you have nothing else as just minus logarithm of modulus of Dedekin function of some complex argument. And here are the, uh, the, the examples of how it works. So this is just Monte Carlo computations of uh, this uh, just dropping random uh, elements. Uh, this is numeric sum summation of this series, and this is uh, just this analytic formula. Uh, short reminder how this Dedekind function looks like. Uh, so it's uh, this one, and has, it has it's a modular form, so it has this property. And then the relief in a complex half plane, upper half plane, uh, is given by, uh, is shown here. And uh, this is the top view. Uh, so, and just because of this tricky structure near the boundary, uh, so we have this uh, fractal uh, relief. And maybe final things which I would like to mention, uh, or I have even more time a bit, uh, is the following, that uh, there is a discontinuous Riemann raindrop function, uh, which is defined in the following way. So uh, I, we have uh, two uh, co-primes, m and n, and x is the fraction, and then uh, this function is defined as the denom denominator of this co-prime, 
and zero otherwise if it's irrational. So it's called also uh, sometimes popcorn function. So it has many names, Toma function, uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like that. And uh, why? Uh, and there is a geometric uh, interpretation of this. So I stay on this line. Uh, I stay on this line, and then I have a forest of trees of uh, unit height. And then again, I emit rays from this point to the top of the uh, of some of some tree, and then I project uh, by Thales theorem. Uh, everything to this interval a and b again Thales comes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so there are so many intersections here so and you see that uh, when uh, my ir my rational angle is such that I miss many trees and the first one is here so then the projection is very small but when uh, it's nearby so the projection is high so this is more or less the same as, as shown here. And what is surprisingly is that uh, uh, these is, uh, points are these uh, raindrop, uh, uh, raindrop uh, construction and uh, lines are this, the function which is given by uh, this expression just uh, as I said. Uh, the Dekind eta function. So I will not touch the subject, but this is related to uh, fractional quantum hole diagram. Uh, this I have taken from uh, this paper. So you, you, you can see that it's uh, very similar. Uh, so, and then final remark is that <coughs> uh, this kind of uh, behavior happens uh, not only in... So you see, what, what, what is interesting is that you have sparse array of very rare events like in in in, in random matrix uh, in sparse matrix but then still you have pattern which is which has uh, this uh, specific ultrametric behavior and uh, is more or less independent on the disorder but what happens that the modular geometry uh, uh, lies behind so and here the final slide is the following uh, so you know this uh, uh, this uh, effect called philotaxis. So it means that you have, for instance, you have pines, and then you compute how many spirals, spirals you have on this pine. And uh, so, for instance, uh, I don't, on, the, on the fruit. And it's always one of Fibonacci numbers, uh, how it happens. And it was a model of uh, Leonid Levitov uh, uh, who said that, okay, so let us take cylinder and distribute uh, points on it, which uh, just repulse. So they, they can slide on the cylinder, but they repulse. And they formulate this. And that what we will do, we will just squeeze the cylinder and allow these points to adjust. Uh, what will happen? They will form new lattices. And this happens by bifurcations. And the angles are not uh, arbitrary, but they are related by Fibonacci transformations. So, and uh, if you write down just the, in the simplest way, the, the, uh, the uh, for instance, supposing that these are Gaussian interactions, uh, uh, just uh, the, the energy. So you can see that the barriers between different uh, lattices have this ultrametric behavior. And this can be seen experimentally, but uh, again, uh, I would like just to mention that the discreteness uh, and the modular symmetry uh, lies be be behind many, uh, many physical effects in, in our life, which looks like continuous. Okay, thank you. One question. Yes, with, with respect to your problem at the beginning with uh, the N, one of us, or the Airy phenomenon. Yeah. So, uh, do you know what happens if you put some cusps, some cusp shapes below? Yeah, it's uh, everything ch changes. 
because the uh, the the uh, boundary should be convex. Only for convex boundary one can guess something. For uh, for the boundary which has some some, some ruptures, uh, there is no any any conjecture. In one oh. of your expressions, you show a sort of Laplace transform, right. uh, which you call uh, somehow related to Anderson model. Right. But it looks like a, a Laplace transform of a, a Levy stable distribution. Uh, it's called stretched exponent. Uh, this exponent to one third uh, is. It's one like one half. It's, it's square root of eight. right, right. Uh, uh, so this one. Yeah. Uh, so you see, you make Laplace transform of this, and you get this. Uh, this is so-called uh, Lipschitz tail, uh, and uh, I would say that. Uh, I don't know any for a mo okay probably it's my my uh, so it's uh, just my fault uh, I don't know how it's related to Levy transform uh, Levy the Laplace uh, Laplace transform of Levy stable with the index one half yeah maybe it's called yeah. Smirnov uh -huh. Levy Smirnov I see okay good mm -hmm. yeah. Is that uh, answering to your question, this is the, uh, when you are close to the zero, you obtain the, the asymptotical behavior like that. And uh, this is the reason why you obtain the A function. The next slide. Because really? Yeah, when you take the true Laplace transform of this exponential function to the n one half, yeah. Is it uh, yeah, you see, in some sense, I go behind. So, uh, so I start with this, and then I forget. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, of course, of course, yes, of course, yes. Uh, just one word: why, uh, how this model comes in? Because uh, this is sort of something like in one plus one dimensions, uh, Spohn and Ferrari tried to uh, consider this kind of model. Uh, this is, in, in my case, is two dimensional. But uh, they say, okay. So let us continue. More than one word. <laughs> so maybe we. I stop. Tell the one. I stop. Next sentence again.